Good morning, church. It's always good to be back in my home church. You know, way back in the early 80s, I was carefully reading through that great book called Desire of Ages. And I came across the chapter called Calvary, especially page 753, which I thank Janet for putting it in the bulletin. It was amazing what I read there. To think that during the time that Christ hung on the cross, he could not see to the portals of the tomb. He felt sin was so offensive to the Father that the separation was to be eternal. In other words, he was going and experiencing the full wrath of God against the sins of the world. And the pain of that God abandonment was so great that he hardly felt the physical pain. And you know, when you read uh, those two great Roman historians, Celsus and Cicero, and their description of the torture of crucifixion, how could Christ not even hardly feel it? Because the pain he was going through, through God abandonment, experiencing the wrath of God against our sins was so terrible. And yet, you know, I have read some wonderful books on the cross. Men like John Stott, the great biblical preacher, or James Dunn, or Anders Negrin, the Swedish theologian, or Leo Morris. None of them come close to what I read in page 753. That's why I had it in your bulletin. It raised a couple of challenges. Number one, Ellen G. White tells us that her writings are the lesser light to lead us to the greater light. And that we are not to preach any beliefs or doctrines unless we can clearly prove it from scripture. That was one of my challenges. The other one was, how could these great scholars and preachers of the, of the Bible not see what Ellen G. White saw with her three years education? So I spent a lot of time digging into this truth and I want to share what I discovered with you. Now, it won't be the first time you have heard this message but you know, when I pastored the Capitol Memorial Church in D.C., every Easter I preached the same sermon for 10 years because I feel that this is a message that needs to be repeated many times. And I would like you to see what this means. Okay. We're going to study Christ's supreme sacrifice for mankind. Can you turn those lights down so that this is a bit darker? Thank you, thank you. This study explains the self-emptying agape love of God essential to developing a faith that is unshakable. Now let's look at the centrality of the cross. The cross of Christ is the central message of the New Testament. Approximately one-third of the four Gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, one-third of those writings put together record the Passion Week. And if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 and 2, Paul wrote to this church, when I came to you, I wanted to know nothing else but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And Ellen G. White tells us that of all professing Christians, Adventists have to be foremost in lifting up Christ, the crucified Savior. So this is why we need to study this. Because of this, the Christian church throughout its history has come up with various theories regarding the atonement. I've just given you a few of them. The satisfaction theory, the forensic theory, the moral influence theory, the ransom theory, and I could add some more, like the governmental theory or the adoption theory. Each of these theories present one aspect of the cross. However, there is one major truth of the cross that Satan has hidden in darkness. He knows that if Christians grasp this truth, his hold on them will go. And do you know how he did it? Quite early in the history of the Christian church, Satan convinced the church fathers that man has by nature an immortal soul. Folks, when you have an immortal soul, your definition of death has to be Greek, not biblical. You know, many years ago, a very famous 
Protestant theologian by the name of Oscar Kuhlman published a book where he compared the death of the great Greek philosopher Socrates with the death of Jesus Christ. When Socrates was facing death, he had a banquet. You know why? Because to him death was the liberation of his soul from an imprisoned body. When Christ faced death, beginning with Gethsemane, it was so painful that it produced drops of blood down his brow. This scholar, Oscar Kuhlman, wrote the book called Immortality of the Soul or the Resurrection of the Body. You can't have both, he says. And he's right. So let's go on. What is this truth of the cross that Satan has hidden in darkness? To answer this important question, we must look at the cross from a Jewish perspective because it was the Jews of Christ's day who demanded his crucifixion. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to John chapter 19. Now I don't normally, I don't normally put text on the screen. I'll tell you why. I want you to use your Bibles. Because too, too many of our people, the Bibles are collecting dust. Chapter 19 of John. To please the Jews, Jesus had, at his pilot had Jesus flogged. And out of mockery placed a crown of thorns on his head. You see the Romans only crucified runaway slaves. And they were worse criminals. Christ was neither of those two. So after... Doing what he did to Christ. In verse 5 of John 19 we read. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Which in their language meant, Is this not enough? He is not a criminal. He is not a runaway slave. You know, it's very interesting folks. That God takes the foolishness of men. And gives it some wonderful truth. They placed a crown of thorns on his head out of mockery. But do you know what God said to Adam and Eve when they sinned? What would vegetation produce? Thorns and what? Thistles. Christ was bearing the curse of the law for us. That's what the crown of thorns represented. But the Jews were not happy with what Pilate did with Jesus. So in verse 6 of John 19 I read, Therefore when the chief priest... And officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Now Pilate represents Rome, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. So according to Roman law, Jesus did not deserve crucifixion. But the strange thing, folks, is that the Jews never practiced crucifixion. So why did they demand Jesus to be crucified. Well, they gave the reason in verse 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law. Very interesting. Not Roman law. We have a law. that They are referring to the Torah. The law that God gave them through Moses. We have a law. According to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Well, let's look at the law that they were referring, the Jews were referring to the law of blasphemy given by God in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. Please turn your Bibles to Leviticus, which is one of the books of the law, chapter 24. Leviticus 24. And we are going to look at verse 16. This is the, the law against blasphemy. And I want you to look very carefully in your Bibles. Here is mine from the New King James. And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly do what? Stone him, not crucify him. The stranger, that is the Gentile, as well as him who is born in the land, the Jew, it doesn't matter which camp you belong to, when he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to what? How? By stoning. Did the Jews not know this part of the law? Yes, they did. For example, if you read John 10, you know, verse uh, 30, 31, and other passages, they tried to stone Jesus many times when he equated himself with the Father. So why crucifixion? Well, they had a reason. 
Why did Jews demand crucifixion instead of stoning? Well, the reason for crucifixion was based on another law God gave them in the Torah. This time is the fifth book of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy. Please turn to it. You need to read what it says here. Deuteronomy chapter 21 and we'll look at the last two verses. Deuteronomy chapter 21. Have you got it? Good. Now let's look at the two last two verses. Verse 22. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and blasphemy is one of them, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree. By that, the Bible doesn't mean a single post like the Jehovah Witness teach. You know, a tree. His body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Now please notice the next statement. For he who is hanged on a tree is accursed of God. Now what did that mean to the Jews? Now remember the Jews in general did not believe in an immortal soul. That's a Greek concept that crept into the Christian church. And I thank God for a very sweet theologian by the name of Edward Fudge who proves clearly that this idea of a mortal soul crept into the Christian church for political reasons. That the wages of sin is not burning in fire forever because you have an immortal soul. But goodbye to life forever. Annihilation. So what did the text mean? That anyone who is hung on a tree is a curse of God. Well, as I mentioned, the Jews generally did not believe in an immortal soul. To them, the wages of sin is goodbye to life. The hope of a believer was resurrection. Let me give you an example. Four days after Lazarus, the friend of Jesus, died, Jesus came to visit him, visit his tomb. And Martha, his sister, saw him in the distance and she ran up to him and said, if you had come early as we had requested, my brother would not have died. And Jesus said, Martha, he will live. And you need to look at her response in John 11. I know he will live in the last day in the resurrection. That is what the Jews believed. And Jesus said, Martha, I am the resurrection. And he proved, her, proved it the very same day. So why? Why did the Jews crucify him? In Christ's day, crucifixion was same or synonymous as hanging on a tree. It meant the irrevocable curse of God. Goodbye to life forever. This is equivalent to the second or eternal death. The wages of sin. This is what it meant to the Jews of Christ's day. That is why when the disciples of Christ preached the gospel to their fellow Jews, they very seldom used the word cross. They preferred to use the word tree because they knew what it meant to their fellow Jews. I have here a couple of texts. You know, there are many, but let me read couple of them. Turn to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 and the Sanhedrin, the governing body of Judaism, had taken the disciples captive, flogged them and commanded them never to preach again in the name of Jesus because they were turning Jerusalem upside down with their message. And in verse 29 of Acts 5 I read, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, now remember, this is the same Peter who denied Christ three times at Pilate's court. We ought to obey God rather than man. What happened? Did he take an energy pill? No, no, no. He was, this was after Pentecost. But look at verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. You ask God to curse this man, and we did it. But Peter goes on to say, he rose from the dead. Now turn to the second text, which is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. I am using this verse because it has very special significance to us. Remember, hanging on the tree was the curse of God against the sins of the world. At least in the, in the case of Christ. Chapter 2 of 1 Peter, verse 24. 
who, that is Christ himself, bore our sins in his own body on the what? Tree. What is Peter telling us? He bore the curse of our sins on the tree. That we having died to sin might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. So the Jews demanded crucifixion because it was synonymous with hanging on a tree. What made the unbelieving Jews demand crucifixion? What was the, why did they do that? Here it is. It was because of the prediction that Christ made to them. In John chapter 2, Jesus and the disciples come to the temple. And they are horrified. They discover that this priest of the temple had turned the temple into a marketplace. Charging huge prices for exchanging the common money for the temple money to buy, you know, the sacrificial animals. Whether it's a lamb or a dove. And in anger... Jesus made a cord that they normally made for donkeys and he said to them in verse 16, How dare you turn my father's house into a marketplace? Let me read it for you. John chapter 2. Look at verse 16. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Remember, he calls the temple my father's house. He's equating himself with God. So in verse 18... We read, so the Jews answered and said to him, What sign, what evidence do you show to us since you do those things? And here's the answer of Jesus in verse 19. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews responded in verse 20. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? Folks, we must be clear. We should never put emphasis in buildings on earth or in heaven. Buildings don't save us. They are very symbolic. Yes, there is a sanctuary in heaven, but that sanctuary doesn't save us. It's the one who's ministering in that sanctuary that is our savior. So in verse 21, I read, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. You know, in Hebrews Chapter 10, verse 5, we read, Sacrifice and offering I would not. That's what God's speaking. But a body you have prepared for me. God prepared for Christ a human body to represent our humanity. And in that body, Jesus fulfilled the perfect will of God. He satisfied the law completely and perfectly. Both his positive demands, which says obey and live, and his justice, disobey you die. So, having Christ crucified, which to the Jews meant cursed by God, plus sealing his tomb and guarded by Roman soldiers, the Jews thought Christ could never rise from the dead. They were absolutely sure this guy was to be there forever. That is why the resurrection of Christ was the greatest and final proof God gave the Jewish nation that Christ was indeed the Messiah. Now Jesus, of course, knew this would happen. So in Luke 13, he said to the Jews, the Jewish nation, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I brought you as a chick brings a chick. Now you don't understand this because your chicks are in cages. Or even they're running loose, it's very different. But you know, in the Middle East, in Africa, the chickens run loose all over your garden. And the mother keeps an eye up in the sky. When they see a kite or an eagle hovering over them, she knows that the, that bird is out to get one of her chicks. So she makes a funny noise and all the chicks come under her wings and the kite cannot touch those chicks. But the chick that is rebellious doesn't, doesn't come to the mother's call. Guess what? That chick is lunch for that bird. And Christ is using that as an example. How often I brought you under my wings. You've killed the prophets. You've killed everybody that I sent. I tried many times to bring you under my wings, but you would not. You deliberately reject me. And when you finally reject me, after my resurrection, I leave your house desolate. Now, folks, Jesus did not say, I'll leave your house desolate for a season. 
nowhere in the new testament not even from paul will the temple ever be restored i don't know where the christian church got this idea from that the temple will be restored that's a misinterpretation of a of a prophet prophecy that is not true but now let's go to stephen's example you know when we go to heaven there'll be a big crowd in line waiting to shake hands with paul including me because he's opened my eyes to the gospel and there'll be one guy sitting on one side hardly anyone shakes his hand and he looks at paul and says man you look very familiar weren't you the guy that ordered my stoning and paul sees him and says stephen come here before i shake hands with anybody i want you to know that we were when we were stoning you you said something that i could not clearly understand because you went you did something that beyond human ability you asked god to forgive us while we were stoning you and i could not get rid of that it bugged my conscience i tried to get rid of it by persecuting the christian church and it failed until i met jesus on the damascus road it was your testimony that was the beginning of my conversion and stephen i can imagine saying it was worth it to see how god has used you to write almost half of the new testament describing the true gospel see all the bible writers of the new testament were not theologians they were farm they were fishermen they were tax collectors paul was the only theologian in the new testament and i thank god that god turned him around and gave him the true meaning of what the old testament was all about so here is stephen facing the death sentence and he says something that really bugged the jews he said i see the heavens open and the guy you murdered is sitting at the right hand of the father and there was too much for them so they silenced him you know i've mentioned this before but when i first went to ethiopia we had one conference the north the Saint, the northern ethiopian conference the total membership of the whole conference was 430 members with nine pastors so i said to the president why can't you hold an effort here because this was in place called gonda the capital the heart of the ethiopian orthodox church and their leader they call him the abuna something like a pope will not allow any denomination to hold an effort there so i said to the president i said look you know that we are a legal church here and number one we are very close friends of the emperor haile selassie you know i had the privilege not only shaking his hand but i had the privilege of trying one of his very famous horses it was an arabian horse that had never been broken and the groomsman said to me would you like to try her he never told me it wasn't broken and i jumped on that saddle and boy i experienced what these kids enjoy when they go to disneyland you know jean and i were traveling one day and the 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 plane was in a dropping down climbing up and everybody's heart was in their mouth and there was a kid behind us wow he said he was enjoying this well i wasn't enjoying that this horse went right down and went way up but i was young then <laughs> i pulled out my feet from the stirrups and as he went right down i jumped out and he went up without me so i am here still alive my time had not yet come well folks here's the big question did god curse christ on the cross that's the big issue because you see the emphasis the christian church the emphasis that these great theologians that have written books on the cross have put is on the physical suffering of christ which he hardly felt because of this doctrine of the immortal soul that is why we have to get rid of this doctrine in the christian church we have given it in our church but we need to get rid of it because it is depriving the cross of its glory so the question is did god curse him well this is the most important question as it demonstrates the supreme sacrifice of christ and god's agape which is unconditional self-emptying love for humanity see in romans 8 verse 7 paul tells us something that you need to know that the mind controlled by the flesh that is our sinful nature is enmity with god 
and he's not subject to the law of God. So it wasn't the Jews that crucified Christ. It was sinful flesh that crucified Christ, the same flesh that you and I have. And if we let our minds control by that flesh, we will do exactly what the Jews did to Christ on the cross. Because, you know, I read a statement, it was a very horrible statement from Ellen G. White. She said, if Jesus was physically present in 1888 when the two brethren presented the truth of Christ our righteousness, if he was physically present there, they would do to him exactly what the Jews did to Christ on the cross. Can you imagine it? Because we have the same flesh that is enmity with God. But thank God, he is very patient and long-suffering. Both the Old and the New Testament clearly indicate that God did curse his son on the cross. Not for blasphemy, but for the sin of the world. Now please notice I use the word sin singular, and I'll explain to you why. But here are some texts. In Romans 8.32, where Paul raises the question, if God is for us, who can be against us? And in verse 32, he proved that God is for us. You know, when I first became an Adventist, I thought Jesus was for me, but I was not sure about the Father. And I had visions of Christ pleading with the Father, please don't be hard on him, I know he's a bit of a rascal, but you know, I died for him, don't be so hard on him. But folks, I have now discovered all three members of the Godhead are on our side. In Romans 8, 16 and 17, the Holy Spirit convinces our spirit that we are joint as with Christ. So the Spirit is on our side. In John 8, I mean Romans 8, 32, God did not spare his own son. Three times Jesus pleaded with the Father, please, if possible, remove the cup. And the cup is not crucifixion, folks. It is the curse of the law. And the father said no. And Jesus responded, not my will, but thy will be done. So the father is on our side. And of course, you know, in Romans 34, 35 and onward, Paul proves clearly that Jesus is also on our side. So all three members of the Godhead are on our side. So stop looking miserable, folks. The reason why we have a judgment is because we have an accuser. And the accuser is not the Father or the Spirit. It is, the, is Satan who accuses us day and night. But here is Christ in Isaiah 53, the Gospel prophet of the Old Testament. Look at what he writes. Chapter, let's look at Isaiah. Oh, Isaiah. Now, as I mentioned before, one is English, one is American. But they are both saying the same thing. Chapter 53. And I think Ron will appreciate both languages. He's become more of an American than an African, but that's fine. He's in an American country. I'm struggling with the American language, but it doesn't matter. We speak somewhat the same language. Chapter 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet he steamed we esteemed him stricken, smitten by who? By God, not by the Romans or the Jews, but by God and afflicted. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? That is, those who belong to him. For he was cut off, and that phrase in Hebrew means he was deprived of a resurrection from the land of the living. Why? For the transgression. Of my people, he was stricken. And transgression meant deliberate breaking a commandment. Not just missing the mark. So my dear people, Isaiah is very clear. Then in Galatians 3.13, which we read at our scripture reading, Christ has, past tense, redeemed us from the curse of the law. Not by nailing the law on the cross, that's not biblical, but by becoming a curse for us. Experiencing the full wrath of God, folks, against our sins very painful that we will never understand. But now, please turn to John chapter 1. Now you will know why I use the word sin in the singular. John chapter 1. Look at verse 29. Here is John the Baptist introducing Jesus to the people. And he came for his baptism. Verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, 
Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the what? Singular plural. Not plural. Read your Bibles. If it's plural, it's, a, it's an error. Because in the original it is singular of the word. Why singular? You see folks, we need to be clear. In the New Testament, sin is both a verb and a noun. The verb has to do with our behavior, so it's in plural. But the noun has to do with our nature. Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, verse, the last part of verse 3, that we are by nature under the wrath of God. In Romans 5, 19, Paul tells us that Adam's sin made us sinners. Folks, you and I were born sinners. And Jesus said to the Pharisees in John 8, 32 and 33, that we who commit sins are, do so because we are slaves of sin. We don't have that freedom. We are slaves to it. So folks, our problem is not our sins. Our sins is only the fruits of what we are by nature. If Christ died only for our sins, he would not solve our problem. If you have an apple tree that produces sour apples, and you do, what you do is remove all the sour apples, you have not solved the problem. Because the next season, guess what? The tree will produce more sour apples. The solution is to cut the tree down, and plant a new tree that produces sweet apples. On the cross, Jesus did not only die for our sins. Of course, when you cut the tree down, the apples come down too. So when on the cross, Jesus died for the sin of the world. He died for what we are by nature. He condemns sin in the flesh, of the flesh, Paul says in Romans 8. And so, my dear people, Jesus dealt with the very core of our human problem, the law of sin in our members, which is the cause of all our sinful behavior. I thank God for that. Okay, let's go on. On the cross, Jesus tasted or experienced second or eternal death, the wages of sin for all mankind. Hebrews 2.9, if you read in your Bibles, Hebrews 2.9, it does say he tasted death for everyone, for all men, or so on. But do you know what the original says? It doesn't use the word man. It uses the word pantes, which means everything. Because when Adam sinned, not only we were cursed, the human race, but even nature was cursed. The animals were cursed. And the trees and the rose trees and bushes, everything were cursed. He died for the curse of this world. He took upon himself everything that was dumped on us and on the world to the fall of Adam. So that one day he can restore this world to its original perfection. And he can restore us. He has the legal right now to forgive us, to save us, and to completely reform us and change us at his second coming. Now please turn, you must turn to 2 Timothy. This is the last letter Paul penned before he was executed as a martyr for Christ. 2 Timothy, chapter 1. You know, this is the book normally used when a pastor is ordained. Because here, Paul is challenging Timothy. Young intern, an introvert, sickly guy, and Paul is saying, defend this gospel. Protect it, preach it, and guard it from false teachers. But in chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, verse 8 to 10, I want verse 10, but I want to start with verse 8 so that you get the context. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. So don't be afraid to preach and believe, uh, teach Christ, nor of me, his prisoner. This is a prison letter in a Roman dungeon. But share with me the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Folks, you can never preach the gospel until, unless you come under fire. Not only from outside, but from within the church. Who, that is Christ, has saved us. Have you got the verb tense? He has already saved us. And called us with a holy calling. So holy living is the fruits of that salvation. Not according to our works. He saved us not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before when? Time began. You know, one day I was discussing with, uh, I have a 
many pastor friends that belong to the other denomination. But this was in Walla Walla. And we were discussing the doctrine of dispensationalism. And I said to him, you know, the Bible does teach dispensationalism. But you guys have perverted that truth. There are Dispensationalists teach that every period in history God has dealt with human beings differently. I said, yes. The dispensation of the Bible is three different periods. Before creation, we have the first dispensation where God chose us in Christ to be holy and without blame. Before the foundation of this world, he is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. That's the first dispensation. The second dispensation is from the fall of Adam to the coming of Christ, where salvation was a promise. The Old Testament saints were saved by a promise. But folks, we are living in the third dispensation, the reality. The birth, life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we have all the more reason to rejoice. But this is what Paul is saying in chapter 1 of 2 Timothy. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ before time began. That's the first dispensation. But has now, now this is the reality, but has now been revealed by the appearing of, sa of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now notice what Christ accomplished. Who has, number one, abolished what? Death. If he abolished death, why do Christians die? No, no, we don't die. We go to sleep. And when you get to my age, sleeping is wonderful. You know, poor Ron is having a hard time. You know, there's, what, about 10 hours different South Africa to here. Next week, week next, after next, I'll be in Ethiopia. Ten hours difference, so when I come back, I will have to struggle. But sleeping is wonderful. He did not abolish the first death. He abolished the second death, folks. That is why in Revelation 20, verse 6, it says, Blessed or happy are those who have part in the first resurrection, that is the believers, on such the second death has no power. Because you cannot punish sin twice. We already were punished the second death in Christ 2,000 years ago. But number two, and brought life and immortality. Folks, immortality is a gift to light through the gospel. This is what Christ accomplished on the cross. This is what he was willing to give up. To realize this, we need to consider two texts. Please turn to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. Listen to what John wrote to the believers of his day. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. This is the message which we, the we the apostles, have heard from him, from Christ, and declared to you. That God is what? Light. And in him is no darkness at all. Keep that in mind. There is no darkness. Now turn to Matthew 27. And we'll read verse 45 and 46. Listen to what takes place here. Jesus is hanging on the cross. And in verse 45, I read these words. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour. Now remember, this is biblical time. Sixth hour is our midday. Ninth hour is three o'clock in the afternoon. The brightest time in Israel. What is happening now? From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. You know, when you read Alan G. White's statement in the, in the thing that I we put in your in, in your bulletin, it was like pitch night, dark night without any light from the moon or the stars. You know, there are liberal scholars today who say, no, 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 this was eclipse, total eclipse of the sun. Well, I have news for you besides the statement Alan G. White makes. This is, a, this is not any natural cause. I was in Zambia when they had the total eclipse of the sun. They were all these scientists with these huge cameras photographing from the beginning to the end. I photographed the whole thing from beginning to end with my digital camera. Very few minutes, less than 20 minutes, not three hours. So when they tell you this was eclipse of the sun, they are lying to you. Folks, what does that tell us? That during those three hours, the Father withdrew himself from the Son. Jesus could not see at that time to the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present him a resurrection. 
he felt sin was so offensive to the father that this separation was to be eternal. Folks, he was experiencing the wrath, the full wrath of God without mercy for you and for me. And he had to make a choice. We have already covered Romans, you know, last year. If you read, remind you, Romans 1, 18, 24, 26, 28, Paul defines the wrath of God as not fire coming down in anger. It's God giving you up for what you have deliberately chosen. God gives you up. If you choose to be on Satan's side, deliberately, after the true gospel has come to you, you have no one to blame for joining Satan in the lake of fire but yourself. Okay, let's come to an end now. How did Jesus reveal his self-emptying love? While Jesus hung on the cross, feeling forsaken by God, the devil tempted him three times to come down and save himself. There you have it in Luke 23, 35 to 39. First, by the Jews. If you are the chosen one, the anointed Messiah, come down and save yourself. Could Jesus do that? Did he have that ability? Has Satan ever tried to tempt you to turn stones into crispy cream donuts? <laughs> you know why he's laughing? He loves them. I love the hole in the middle, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Satan did tempt Christ to turn stones into bread. He knew who he was. Then the soldiers, the Roman soldiers said, if you are the king of the Jews, come down and save yourself. And the third time was the thief on the left hand side of the cross. You know what he said? After blaspheming him, come down and save yourself and us. And here's the problem, folks. Christ could have come down from the cross and saved himself. But he could not save himself and the human race at the same time. He had to make a choice. What choice would you have made if you were in his shoes? Well, I wonder. What would happen if Christ had come down and saved himself? There are three things would happen. The human race would be lost. Number two, Satan would have won the battle in the great controversy between God and Christ, between God and Satan. And number three, the Godhead would have split and God would have an eternal enemy. Can you imagine the risk that was taken at the cross? Thank God, Christ chose to say goodbye to life, not for three days, that's no sacrifice for God who lives in eternity. It's like the Muslims during Ramadan. You know, from sunrise to sunset, they have nothing to eat, nothing to drink. They can't even swallow their spittle. But guess what? After sundown, they gorge themselves. We, we, we experienced that in Kuwait during Ramadan. And we were told by the family that the average Muslim spends more money on food during Ramadan than the rest of the year. But they become nocturnal. They gorge themselves. And I enjoyed the salads and the wonderful baklava and the falafels when we ate with that home. They had a wonderful meal after sunset. But Christ had to make a choice. And what did he choose? He chose to say goodbye to life. He chose to give his eternal life to you and to me and in exchange accept our curse of the law. This is what constitutes Christ's supreme sacrifice for mankind. Okay? In so doing, he satisfied the law of God and demonstrated that he loved sinful mankind more than who? Himself. It's beyond our imagination, folks. Isaiah 53 verse 11 says, God saw the choice he made. He saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied that the the wages of sin was paid. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And same book, chapter 8 verse 9 says He was rich, he became poor that we who are poor may become what? Rich. Isn't that wonderful? But I have given you a text that I want you to memorize. I know it will help you in the time of trouble. Romans chapter 8. Let me read it for you. Romans chapter 8 and we'll read verse 35 to 39. Please 
memorize this text for your own good. Paul is raising a question. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And we will face all this in the time of trouble. Look at his answer. In verse 37. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, I am convinced beyond any shadow of a doubt that neither or neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, that is the devil and his angels, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, terrorism, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me give you an experience. Since the 13th Sabbath offering is going to Kenya, one of my jobs in East Africa was university chaplain because you see we have a lot of students in government universities and the African pastors are afraid to touch them because they have very high IQs. So we formed that university chaplains and one of the students from Nairobi University came up to me and he said, Pastor, my uncle is, is in Kenyatta Hospital that is in Nairobi who is dying of leukemia. Probation has closed. Remember, I'm an African preacher. They don't, you can watch football for four hours, you can hear the gospel for a little longer than 45 minutes. Am I correct? Okay, let's go on. Keep the lights on, folks. You don't have to go far to eat next, your meal. It's right on the corner. Okay, now here's the situation, folks. This man who was dying of leukemia, the doctor gave him three months was a pastor of his church in Kisumu, one of the big towns in, along the Lake Victoria. It is where President Obama's father comes from. He was the pastor for 20 years in this church. He's now dying of leukemia and he's afraid to die. So I went to visit him. And as soon as I introduced myself, he said, Pastor, please, please, I'm afraid to die. I said, why? He said, I've committed the unpardonable sin. I said, really? How can a pastor who preaches Christ commit the unpardonable sin? Of course, he had no idea what that meant. And he told me the sad story. His daughter in high school became pregnant, which was a disgrace to him. So he took her to a witch doctor to have it an abortion. And it, it killed her. And now he thinks God is punishing him for what he did. He said, I prayed to God a thousand times. He will not forgive me. And now he's punishing me. That's his view of God. And I said, when did this happen? Ten years ago. So I said, what did you preach for ten years? He said, don't ask me, Pastor. I said, you don't need my prayers. You need some good news. So I sat down by his bedside for about two hours. I shared with him the gospel. And I asked him one question. Because this was during Easter time. What did Jesus say to that criminal on the right hand side? By the way, those two criminals represent the entire human race. The gospel will divide humanity in only two groups. Sheep and goats. Believers and unbelievers. The men on the right and the men on the left were both convicted by the Holy Spirit. The man in the middle was dying for both of them. But the man on the right was con accepted the conviction. And he said to Jesus, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now please keep in mind, from the Roman historians, it takes between three to seven days to die on the cross. So Jesus had ample time to give this guy a Bible study and ask him 13 questions. <laughs> Did he do it? He didn't even ask him to repent. He didn't even ask him to confess his sins. He said, today, this very moment, heaven is yours. And if you read John 5, 24, Jesus says to every believer, the moment you believe in him and his gospel, you have already passed from death to life. Folks, the gospel is not good advice. It's incredible good news. The world needs to hear that. So, finally, I saw a smile on his face. And I left him with some peace. Two months later, I decided to visit him. Because the doctors gave him only three months. And he, I went and his ward. It was a long ward with 50 beds. And he was somewhere in the middle. So I went to his bed and it was empty. And I thought, maybe he's dead. But there was a nurse nearby and I said to her, 
where is Mr. Otiano? Did he die? And before she could answer, I heard my name at the end of the ward. Pastor, I'm here. Do you know what he was doing? He was sitting by the bedside of a Messiah. Now, Jean did not tell you, but the Messiah men, not the women, but the Messiah men drink cow's blood. They mix it with the milk in that goat that you saw. And that's, by the way, I just take a sip once just to see what it tasted like. It certainly was not like root beer float. I can promise you that. <laughs> but you see what happened is, I said, what on earth are you doing? You should be in bed. And I'll never forget what he said to me. Pastor, I'm no longer afraid to die. But before I die, I want to share this good news with every one of these people because every one of them are dying of a terminal disease. And I'm trying to convince this Messiah that he's dying because he drank cow's blood. And I'm trying to share with him that the blood of Christ has cleansed him from all sins and, and all unrighteousness. That is what the power of the gospel does. You know, on Thursday, April 4, I received an email from a guy that heard me, the same message, 20 years ago. I don't remember the city, the church, it was in this country. But he was so impressed with this message that 20 years later he writes me this long email. I'll read you just one paragraph. Listen to what he wrote. What this, this is the love of God revealed on the cross. What this tells me and what I understand is that God loves me no matter what, even when I am at my worst. It is incredible how powerful that knowledge is and you are right. Once you understand how much God loves us, and how much he was willing to give up, you can never be the same again. And it is my prayer, you will never be the same again. So that your one desire in our town hall meeting is, is for me to live is Christ. That is my prayer. Let us pray. Loving Father, we pause to thank you for your indescribable gift, Jesus Christ, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He was willing to say goodbye to life forever. That's beyond our comprehension for a God who lives in eternity and in glory. But we thank you that you are willing to take our curse of the law, that you, were, you came in our shoes and took everything that we deserve on the cross. Lord, may this love transform us so that with Paul we will say, for me now to live is Christ, and to die is profit, so that we don't even have to worry if we die about the IRS, because we are sleeping in peace until you come to take us to heaven. Until then, may we lift up Christ to a world that is groping in darkness. That is our prayer. So we say with Paul, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. May God bless you. Amen.